And I remember you and a couple other officers, man, it really struck me. Pulling your, drawing your guns as soon as you got out of the car and immediately running towards the area of fire. Mm-hmm. And you have a career where you have multiple incidents like that. You have your officers and you, as you ascend to chief and you're there for them. And then all of a sudden you're retired, it's gone. Mm-hmm. That's the difficulty that I think we encounter. But let's talk about the feelings you have from going from the adrenaline rush of mm-hmm. everyday work to regular life. Yeah. What are the struggles we go through? How do we acclimate to retirement? I am Robert Asensio, and directly to my right is my co-host, retired police chief, military historian, David Magnuson. How are you, sir? Doing great. How about you? Oh, man, I'm happy. We have a friend of ours, right? A colleague of yours. A colleague, yeah. Why don't you introduce our guest? And I had the honor, and really I say it's an honor, for friendship and, and, and working together in some high liability units too, um, and, and still maintaining a friendship, Renee Landa. So it's yeah. it's great to see you, man. Good to see you. Thank really you, David. Thank you very much, Robert. Good yeah. to see you. Chief, guys. right? Good so you retired you, as the police chief of South Miami Police Department. For those of you that are going to be watching us on YouTube, and he's the traditional podcast platforms beyond the Community News Network. South Miami's in the city. It's a city in the state of Florida. Right. How are you? Good, good. Doing great, Dan. Tell us about <clears throat> your retirement. Do you know, the main thing has been to kind of get used to to the change. Uh, when you do something for 43 years, and uh, to this day, I'm still passionate about my profession. Um, you know, you walk away from something, but, um, you know, the anxiety is there because, you know, you still want to be you know, you, you want to st- still be in it. You still can't get it out of your system. So the, the difficulty for me has been the anxiety level and how to just be able to relax for once, you know, maybe read a, a book somewhere and I, I'm not thinking about, you know, what should I be doing now instead of doing this, you know. What did you do when, when I mean, how did you transition into retirement life? When I left the city after 30, within a month, I was up in North Carolina, new, new place, new people, new place to live new department, an outsider coming in. So there was no time to really, you know, cycle down a little bit. Then coming back to El Portel, you know, this, the same thing. Once that was over with, uh, it was, what was I gonna do differently now? And what I've always called it was the Ali syndrome. That sometimes you stay in the game just a little bit too long. But let's talk about the feelings you have from going from the adrenaline rush of mm. everyday work to regular life. Yeah. But, you know, the adrenaline rush is something big. Uh, you know, I'm with David now, and uh, geez, if you're going to talk about another guy that has an adrenaline rush when we do the job, it's him. And it's genuine. And those type of characters, those type of personalities in a police department, they all kind of get together because I love the type of cop he is. He's going in harm's way. He doesn't care. He's going to do it professionally. He's going to do it right. And he's going to have the back of everybody that's there. And that just draws me to what I wanted to do. You know, uh, 43 years on a police department, we were in narcotics, patrol for six. Then I went to narcotics for another five or six. I got on SWAT Mm -hmm. in 86, 87 and was there for 16 years. It's just the, not the adrenaline rush, but it's just, you know, to want to do the job to the best that you can and then have passion for it. Uh, you know, uh, police officers go out and, uh, you know, they wear that uniform, put the badge on, and you got to have passion to put your life on the line every single day that you go out there to do that. Uh, but there, you know, there are just some people that are across the board that are just, you know, very, very passionate. They want to go out there. They want that excitement. They want to make the big arrests. They want to make the big seizures. They want to get the guns off the street. Uh, we want to get the dope off the street so kids aren't involved with that, you know, and bring the mm-hmm. violence down. And you get pumped up to do that. Yeah, David, you had a great career in the city and and then post the city. Yeah, you know, and and it's uh, it's habitual. It's it's something that you look to do. Mm-hmm. Now, I will say this, and I can speak for myself in this that I had interest outside. I always, you know, when I was off or doing something, or you know, uh, you get it done. And I think that's that's one of the secrets. But when I got back to work, I couldn't wait to put that uniform on, or if I was in plain clothes, strap the strap the badge on the gun and get going and get moving and look at the time period you're talking 1980 mm-hmm. you're talking about drugs that was some rough co- times cocaine yeah. wars mario boatlift uh you know all the different uh, civil 
rights things that were going on, all the disturbances that we were having. And it was a in, in this entire country, Miami was like the focal point, you know, and, and it was stressful. The workload was amazing, mm -hmm. especially if you were in homicide or narcotics. Oh, my God. It was just left and right. You were just busy every single day. But yes, out of 10, 12 hour days and search warrants and recoveries and seizures of, of guns and all that mm -hmm. other stuff, the camaraderie, the friendship, the joking around, it just broke the ice to relax a little bit because that's yeah. very, very stressful. Yeah. I remember when I came on 88, 89, I was going through the academy, 88, 89. It seemed like there was a shooting every day, right? You go out to, on, on the road, with, regardless of what the shift you were on, there was some type of shooting, some type of chaos going on regularly. The tourist robberies. Yeah. Oh, setting up one. on the tourist robberies. Another one. I mean, that, yeah. and that was... Uh, and the task force that was formed. The task I mean, force, yeah, that literally... Tourists against robberies. Star... Remember being in a, in a meeting where Gover then Governor Childs over the you know the squawk box there wasn't a speaker on the phone there were no other cell phone and he basically just said in that Southern drawl make it stop yeah and you guys did and we and we did yeah yeah because a lot of the robberies were around the city of Miami city, a couple yeah. of German and tourists were killed uh, do you remember the German tourist name Ruka, uh, Uwe Ruckerband and Barbara Jensen Muller oh wow. yeah which. Impacted the city he got run over and the by region. Our own car on the side of 95, and he was on uh, 95 southbound, just going to turn off to eight uh, to the beach 395, and uh, chick called gangsta bitch shot and killed. That's right. Who caught her? I, uh, was it the city or the task force? Or the I, I think it was the task force that caught her, but I know the city had a big uh, big part in that. Yeah. 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 And some crazy times, and and you know. For those of you that are going to be watching, you know, we're talking to two cops, retired police executives, who were instrumental at a time when crime really spiked in South Florida in running units and be part of units that police units that brought stability back to a community, a region that was in crisis because the economic impact of tourists being targeted. Mm -hmm was so great that it forced the legislature right. to put in laws that, remember the rental cars? The E-tags. E yeah, with e -tags, the tags. Yeah. They got rid of the tags. Where the subjects would target. That's they correct. target a rental come because they go the and rob you. You're not going to come back to be a witness and you were gone. Mm -hmm. And then you're talking about the finance. Remember, there was 365, 81, 82, 365, 400 murders. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then if you remember the magazine cover that it says Paradise Lost. Time Magazine. Time yeah. Magazine, mm -hmm. remember that? And they put Paradise Lost, and they did two or three covers of that. And just like you're saying, is are any tourists going to come to an area where you're having murders like that and shootings yeah. like you were saying every single day? Yeah, I remember it was the German government that was cautioning their not, citizens from to come. visiting South Florida. Mm, correct, correct. So here we have the officers part of the team or part of a whole bunch of officers, right? But you guys were instrumental to making sure that South Florida regained its safety, you know, perception. We, 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 the streets were safe. Absolutely. And, and I, I can't thank you enough, man. No, thank I mean, you. And I learned a lot from you guys. Yeah. Well, you, were so, part, you were part of that. Yeah, well, I learned a lot from you guys. I was a kid. <laughs> it was also a community <laughs> policing component. Yeah. Because we had the, what I used to call the riots du jour. Every time you turned around, it was a riot. Yeah. So the secret was don't turn around anymore. Well, I was now, so scared to screw up. Where if we were thought if I screwed up, I would probably cause a riot. <laughs> but I mean, and, and then it stopped because there was, so there was, you know, while you had the good aggressive policing going on, there was a component too where, where the city, the area matured. Yeah. And, and to be fair, with all the sports riots you used to see around the country, win or lose a championship, you never had a sports riot here. The UM kept winning every year. You never had a sports riot here. So there was a maturity. Did that include here. the Dolphins? Dolph well, that was so long ago. Nixon was president the last time they won a Super Bowl. Well, 72. But I'm not going to get it. I'm a Rams fan anyway. So, you know. No, but I mean, there's a maturity level there. And I think the police helped get there uh, along the way, too. They bought into it. Right. Yeah. And the leadership, as we were young, aggressive cops, we, we morphed into sergeants, lieutenants, moved up the ranks. And, and I think what, what made us successful on the street, we sort of talked it to those working for us mm -hmm. at every level, and they bought into it. Mm -hmm. well, let's talk about that change of culture, right? Mm -hmm. Because we went, you were telling me in the car that, you know, at one point, I remember we did not talk about our struggles. Mm -hmm. If no. we went to a scene and got sick, 
because of what we saw, we kept it to ourselves. Mm -hmm. If we got into a fight or a brawl or whatever it was, we kept it to ourselves. We did speak to our, you know, our brothers and sisters, but I think we were very limited in what we would share. And then we carried that crap home mm -hmm. and caused all kinds of havoc in our relationships. Right. Let's talk about the change in culture from where we were when we first started to, to, to now. How do you see the change? Well, what I've seen through the, the training that we're doing with Boulder Crest. Well, let's been, talk about that. This yeah, it, it, that's incredible. First and foremost, it, it was a weakness in those days to show any type of weakness, and you couldn't do that. So I can't tell you I'm going through a divorce, I lost my mother, whatever it could be, to my partner and my friend, and then 20 minutes later, we're going through a door with a bad guy that has a gun, and then he turns and looks at me and goes, are you okay? Because you were just telling in a minute, because I need you focused. We're going through the door. I need you to focus to get my back. Uh, so that wasn't accepted. Uh, realized, too, we had a lot of Vietnam vets mm -hmm. that uh, we were working with in, in the early 80s yeah. when we got on. Uh, so that was very closed-minded, and, and, and you just could not show that weakness. If you had a great partner, if you had uh, somebody at home that you could really relate to, and that's what it's about, is it, family, and going home, and you could express that and let go. But most uh, officers didn't do that. In this training that just kicked off about three years ago, it is amazing uh, to see the officers come in and open up and let go. Uh, I, I couldn't believe it from day one when this happened. I don't know if it's the era, I don't know if it's the time right now of all the stresses that we've been through that people are just opening up because mm -hmm. the stress factor is always going to be there. Every single human being in this lifetime is going to struggle. You're going to struggle in this lifetime because things are going to happen to you either in your personal life or your work life uh, that, you know, that you're going to carry with you, that you're struggling. So our concern and issue is to police well, you have to be well. So if I'm struggling at home with my sister that just passed away from cancer or my mother or son or maybe I have an autistic son, I got to wake up tomorrow morning, put on my uniform and badge, and I got to go out and I got to help other people with their problems. So our focus uh, through Boulder Crest and what we're doing is a program called Struggle Well. Uh, is that Boulder Crest Foundation for those that want to look yes, it up on Boulder the Crest Foundation? On the, on the and, and the bottom line is, you know, uh, they've been working with military personnel with PTSD for years. Uh, Ken Falk. Uh, came up with a plan. Uh, and Is he but, the Navy SEAL? No, he worked with the military and his he was in uh, demolitions. Okay. And what he saw was he had a lot of friends uh, that came at that lost limbs, that lost their lives and things like that. And what he wanted to do is now give back to assist people through the PTSD because a lot of the military personnel that came back had PTSD. Uh, and now what he did is uh, a few years ago wanted to completely focus that uh, about three and a half years ago further from some other departments but for dade county three years ago we kicked this off um 100 focus for first responders for law enforcement uh and i could not believe you know we came back uh you know presented it to the chiefs at that time i was the president of uh miami dade county association of chiefs of police every single chief in dade county uh went with it 100 percent support uh, to put our officers through it. And we've had a class once a month since then for the last three years with 35 to 30 officers every single month from 37 different municipalities in Dade County and coming in to go through the training. And it's training. We've done training all our lives on domestic violence. You go to the range and you go shoot robbery investigations. But you know what? Nobody ever gave back. Nobody ever cared about the officers. You know, we were all in all the world doing our own thing. Um, my generation, too, they didn't do anything. Uh, and now, you know, we have to take care of our own people, take care of our own officers. They have lives, uh, and they deserve to live a beautiful family life and go back home with none of the struggles. And believe me, the experiences we were, we were just talking about, those are experiences, but those are struggles thing in, in life that we go through. That's a hypervigilant life that you live you got to watch the door when you're eating. You got to make sure you got 15 or 20 minutes. You got to be careful when you're being filmed. I mean, it's a very hypervigilant life that we live. And this is what's that is to give back to them, you know. Yeah. David, you're you we talk about training all the time. Yeah. You know, um warrior path, right? With two H's, progressive alternative training, helping heroes. Absolutely. And I did more research. 30% of combat veterans first responders are suffering in silence. Yes. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot. 
And we've incorporated officers, dispatchers, our own chaplains that are involved. Uh, we've even got, uh, you know, my main focus now, what we're trying to push also is, is to bring in back our retirees. Uh, this is a training five days, once a month. It's no cost. You know, we bring in the people, they don't have to pay for anything. And like I said, Boulder Crest is just taking this by the onset. Uh, you know, we also have a community police foundation that has come in and supported us uh, with the, uh, the entire program. And it's just fantastic. And like I said, I just can't believe how many officers are opening up and they walk out on the fifth day when they walk out, it smiles, yeah. you know, hugs and everything else. And, well, a lot of, not just officers, but a lot of people in the community are struggling, silently struggling, right. dealing with mental health issues, emotional issues, the scars of life, addiction, and they just can't figure out how to get out of there. Mm -hmm. So I think you pointed out a couple things. When you retire, the peer support right. is very important. Your mm -hmm. family being there, your colleagues, and now this type of program. What experiences are you having with this post-traumatic growth class program that you're putting on well we're realizing one thing is is 75 to 80 percent of the officers that are coming in there are dealing with personal issues not police issues they're dealing with personal issues we're only human they, exactly and li like i said before every single person in this lifetime will struggle it's impossible to go through this lifetime where you're not going to struggle you're going to lose a family member uh we've had people that have come in and, and let's just take a for case point uh, an officer comes in and he's got uh, a son that disliked right and he has to wake up every single day and he has to take care of that son mm. and he has to make sure that he has everything for him all the training the medical stuff that he needs and everything else what are his thoughts his thoughts are who's going to take care of my son when i pass away who's going to take care of him nobody can do it better than i can is my d younger daughter going to have to pick up the burden of that and then to think in your mind who you know nobody can can take care of his all of that and then that man has to come to work every single day now, that's just one little part, but there's there's people that have lost family members uh, to cancer, to heart attacks, whatever they may be. And, and these officers have to come every single day and put on that uniform and come and take other people's problems. Post-traumatic growth is understanding that we will in this lifetime go through struggles, accept what is happening and, and accept what you are looking at. And then all of a sudden you grow from that. OK, you grow from that. And then what it is, is you apply that growth because you will you, you can grow out of struggling. You can. Uh, but there's steps to it. And that's what we teach. And then what we do is you apply that the full circle is coming back and serving, you know. And, and what I mean by that is I can walk down the street and then David's we meet again. We have a coffee and he tells me, you know, last week I had a tough time. You know, I, I lost a family member to cancer. And if I lost a family member to cancer and I went through it, my, my program is to listen to him and to understand what he's talking about. But it's genuine because we were both in the same and we both have experiences. And that's how we relate that back. And the post-traumatic growth is exactly that, that we can grow from the struggle and the pain. Wow. Powerful. Yeah. Very good. It's not to clam up, it's to talk. To talk it's about to talk it. About it right? And that's what destroys you when you clam up and you keep it inside. And it can go on a year or two years, but it's ripping up. Do you think that that's why there's such a high suicide rate amongst our retirees? Because we haven't shared? Yeah, two to three years ago, the rate was 168 in one year. Mm -hmm. It was the number one killer for law enforcement. The number one usually is traffic accidents. Mm -hmm. But the first one uh, two years ago was Is that for retirees or no, no, all, all, law enforcement. all law enforcement? Yeah. All law enforcement. And, and that's what I'm trying to reach now is trying to get more of our retirees back involved with us and come to the class. So I, I had two retirees just recently in a class, and it was so incredible to see someone who's done 30 years of law enforcement sharing their experiences with two officers that were on only two or three years. It was amazing. And they opened up. They were understanding each other. It just went very, very well. This is now out to 16, 18 states in the country. Uh, we've reached out uh, from Arizona, New Jersey, Georgia, North Carolina, and they're all coming in, getting the training from us here, or we're going to their facilities, and they're going to continue this, doing that. So the 18 states have gone across. Um, 
it's just an amazing program. I, I can't believe it's grown across the country like this. But what, 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 you know, training that's always been needed could not be more important than for our officers themselves. You know, uh, David say there there are warriors, there are heroes. They are to me. Uh, law enforcement will always be that, uh, and you make sure that they can come out. Um, the training is for free. Uh, if you want to reach out, they can call the Miami Dade Chiefs organization, or I'll leave you also some information for them to call. They can pick up the phone call. I don't care if it's the last minute. Can thing. you find it online with the? I I, I went to the website. Uh, struggle yeah. well post traumatic growth yeah. and i found it i found the website and yeah. you're featured yeah they they did a couple they did a couple of videos they came down uh day county was really uh was a big runner in this uh you know day like i said day chief supported this 100 percent starting three years ago the the executive board the the body all the chiefs have continued to do it they keep sending their officers so it's been a big deal and it's been a lot of their their media that they've put out and, you know, we want to continue the program. I want to make sure um, all the officers get the training that they need. Uh, it's Outstanding. Important. So we have two minutes left. David, wanna, any party, you any know, closing thoughts here? You know, back, way back when, one of the classes that they used to offer, and you, you remember, this was um, stress, yes. stress training, right? Yes, stress, yes. stress training. Yeah. See how in the past couple of decades, how that has really now yeah. has gone to helping people now and how it's it's morphed and it's not stress remember that week of stress yeah. training yeah. i don't know what that meant but you know uh we were more stressful <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> then, then we, but this this is important yeah and this what is it just people are talking they open up it's about them it's not about a department it's not about a chief this training is about the officers and that said the first day it's not your department this is training is for you it's about you how you want to take it what you want to do with it and when people get involved and we talk and they talk about the stress of the job, other things that they've been through, they're opening, they're letting go, they, they get they get rid of it. I had a sign years that I put on the department and it, it said, make a difference. You know, and what I was talking about, the officers going out making a difference mm -hmm. in someone's life. Uh, well, that's what I'm focusing on now. I want to make a difference in an officer's life and make sure they get this training that they need for them and their families. Yeah, and for anyone that's not in law enforcement, the benefit of this type of training is far exceeds the officer themselves or the officer's family is that the the methodology here is that an officer who is doing well and dealing well with a natural acts that they encounter, the constant barrage of traumatic incidents that they come across and deal with, the better it will be for the public. Public safety is better served mm -hmm. when our officers are in their best state. Correct. Am I right? Absolutely. That's the example we always give with the uh, air mask falling out in the plane when it decompresses. You put it on yourself first, first because you can't be of use to anybody else unless you're at your best. Yeah. Absolutely. On that note, uh, you, the audience, we want to thank you for always being there. You can find us on Beyond the Miami's Community News Network uh, on YouTube, Spotify, and all the other podcast channels under Silent Struggle, hosted by Military and police veterans, Michelle, I'm sorry, Rachel Brummage, our producer behind the scenes. Thank you, Michael Miller, Grant Miller, the Community News Network, and you again, the audience. We'll talk to you next time.